So earlier, the Chief Commissioner said that Texas' aim is to find new ways of hearing the authentic student voice. And so we've got the highlight, without doubt. I'll let you into a secret, actually. For all the years I've been to higher education conferences and there's a student panel, I'm like, I want to be the chair of the student panel. It's the best part of any conference. So it so happens I will be chairing the student panel called Student Sentiments, and we're going to invite our students up now to join us in the chairs. So come up, everyone. Don't be worried. It's easy up here. It's fun. And uh, while they're coming up, I want to acknowledge our visual artist, Paul, I believe. Give it away, Paul. That's amazing. That is such a talent. You should see my version of that. It's nothing like that at all. Any seat's good. Um, so let me introduce you to our, our student panel, and I think you'll, um, you'll hear some fantastic insights, and they've just seen the data on what the whole of the sector is saying. Now we're going to go to some authentic student experiences. And um, let me grab a seat here. So first, we're not in any particular order. So Georgie Beatty, President of the National Union of Students and Undergraduate Art Student of La Trobe University. And online, we've got Georgie McDade. Hi, Georgie. Good to see you. You're really nice and big up there. So <laughs> you look fantastic. Um, great for you to be here. You're an undergraduate biotechnology and sociology student at Swinburne University and the Disabilities Officer of the National Union of Students. Thanks for joining us online today. Mr. Tisha Joshi, Master of International Relations student at the University of Sydney. Dr. Charlene Leroy Dyer, President of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Postgraduate Association. And also Lena Lee, Film Production Student, SIE Institute of Melbourne. Thanks for joining us, Lena. And finally, Anushka Mukherjee, an economic <coughs> student at the University of Western Australia and National Equity Officer, the Council of International Students Australia. So a huge panel, lots of insights, very diverse panel. I'm going to each ask each of our panellists to just give a two-minute reflection on the topic of this panel, which is a student sentiments. What does a future fit student experience look like today? And obviously reflecting their own experiences. And I'm sorry you're the first because you're next to me, so off yeah. you go. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it is an extremely honour honor to be here. Uh, so, since I have only two minutes, I would like to uh, share my opinion on future fit student experience with four E's. Engagement, education, employment, and equity. Engagement. So, one of the, one of the uh, things that make a student's experience either um, great or unfortunate at the university is uh, the question how uh, connected that student feels uh, with the campus, with peers. And when I say peers, uh, it is the engagement with domestic and international students, uh, domestic and international students as well. So this is a very s important part. And most international students feel uh, homesick when they first come here, maybe because they are f uh, missing their families, friends, or maybe boyfriend or girlfriend, who knows. Uh, so that's, that's very important. So uh, if there is no domestic and international students' engagement, then um, uh, like, you know, uh, international students bring diversity to the university, which universities often feel proud of. Uh, but without cross-cultural interaction, can that really be called a diversity? Uh, so we should think about it. And uh, I can proudly say that my university, the University of Sydney, has taken this issue very seriously. And through various initiatives, such as student partner program, peer mentoring, or various student well-being programs, they are supporting this thing. And the second uh, aspect, uh, the second E, is the education. Ne uh, so there is a need for the reconsideration of uh, education style, particularly in the social sciences, which I think is very much theoretical and fact-based learning. Uh, nothing wrong in it. Uh, nothing wrong in, wrong in it because uh, I mean theories are the uh, foundation of any academic discipline, and one must definitely learn about it. Uh, but the question is, in this digital world, wherein all such information is available on the internet, then uh, like. Is this education style future fit? Then, like, this leads me uh, to believe that the inclusion of more opportunities to develop professional, personal, and um, 
practical opportunities, uh, pra practical development, that would make students' uh, mind well formed, you know, uh, which, which would react when face uh, challenges in real life rather than well informed mind, you know, as Dr. Shashikaru says. So, uh, the third aspect is the employability. The biggest concern that most in international students face. Um, may, and uh, Lisa highlighted that it is mainly because of the residency status of the international students. And let, let me give you an example. I went to, the, uh, I went to one uh, student uh, uh, jobs and internship fair where there were 29 companies. Out of those 29 companies, only 10 were hiring international students. And out of those 10, only three were hiring social sciences students. So, I mean, yes, I agree that, you know, as universities say that their degree provides uh, uh, like uh, transferable, transferable practical skills. Of course they do, but where to transfer those skills, you know? Is there any opportunity? So that's the thing. And the last is equity. Uh, sorry, I'm stressing it long. So the, although the world is, you know, uh, the, the literacy rate has increased from 68% uh, in 1980s to 87% in 2020, according to the World Bank. However, when it comes to the educational level at high, uh, the, the tertiary education, uh, there are some groups uh, who, because of historical and societal oppression, repression, uh, and exclusion, uh, have remained at the margin. So there is a need of inclusion of excluded. And University of Sydney, by providing equity scholarship to the student, to a student like me who come from, you know, Delhi slums and uh, you know, where people don't even think about going to the university and similar equal, uh, equity of scholarship for First Nation people or other university and uh, some universities lowering the ATAR score for female candidate to boost their enrollments. These are the steps that I think uh, would be great for future fit student experience. Thank you so much. Um, I might head now down to the other end of the panel just to keep you on your toes down there. It's a long way. Uh, Lena, I'm going to go to you. Just two minutes uh, on your reflections of a future fit student experience. Yeah, so future fit student experience. So that phrase, I think, is quite multifaceted and can be interpret interpreted in a lot of different ways. So my interpretation, I think I focus a lot on the word future. Um, so, I mean, the future is a very exciting uh, prospect, um, but it's also can be quite scary and daunting uh, for students, especially when we consider, you know, there are students who uh, enter university going, yep, uh, I have this career in mind, that's exactly what I, what I want to do. But then there are also students who have an idea of what area they want to join, but have no idea what career um, they're going to end up in. Um, and I think university or tertiary education is well placed to sort of equip students um, not just with, you know, teaching us, you know, technical skills and knowledge um, associated with their areas of um, learning, but also equally important is um, equipping us with the skills to adapt to a future that is so unknown. You know, new technology is emerging every day, um, new areas of study. So, um, yeah, just sort of bridging that gap and teaching um, students skills, how to adapt um, and how to work collaboratively. Um, those sorts of things are also very important to uh, consider and, you know, incorporate into a student's learning experience. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sure we're going to address that when we have our discussion shortly. Uh, Charlene, I'm going to go to you next. Oh, thanks. Um, firstly, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, um, these unceded lands, and pay my respects to elders past and present and any Aboriginal people in the room today. Um, I think the future fit for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students in this country um, is really important to centre university experiences around our communities. So one of the things that I've been talking about for a long time is having universities on country as opposed to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students having to leave country and homelands to go to universities. So it's really important that we have the flexibility to have that um, so that we can close the gap on our disadvantage in this country. I think they also need to talk about decolonising our curriculum and how we can centre Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and knowledges um, into all of our university degrees. Um, I note that Professor Glenn talked about this um, a bit earlier in the keynote. 
Um, one of the things I think we also need to do is make our campuses safer for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Recent surveys have um, shown that this is not the case, so it's really important to do that. Um, one of the things, and I represent postgraduate students, obviously, um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander postgraduate students are mature age students. Um, sitting here before you is the mature age student on the, camp, on the panel. Um, but also, you know, we leave our jobs to go back to university to make a difference in our communities. But the funding or the scholarships that we receive um, isn't adequate to help us to do that. Often we've got families. I came back to university, I had a family to feed. I was the carer of my um, disabled partner. So a scholarship just didn't really cut it. So we need to think about other ways that we can ensure that we're helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students to uh, have a university education and a postgraduate education. I mean, I'm really proud to say that I was the first Aboriginal person to graduate from a PhD in management at my university back then, the University of Newcastle. Um, it was a massive achievement and it was um, a really difficult slog to do. Um, we had our, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Centre on campus. They're an enormous help, but the funding that they receive from governments isn't adequate. And especially during the you know, coalition governments, the funding was actually cut, or in real terms, cut. Um, I'm glad to see that the new government is actually increasing funding from next year for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, which is welcome, but there needs to be more because we've gone backwards for so long. Our, our, our percentages of completion of um, universities is well below that of our domestic and our international students. So I think universities and um, governments have a lot of work to do to make up that space. Thanks, Aline. Uh, Anushka. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, for me, when I think of the future, I think of the hybrid mode of learning that we're going into. So we've got the online mode of learning and the on-campus mode of learning. Um, a bit about me, I actually came to Perth to study my undergrad in 2019, spent one and a half years studying, and then pandemic happened, and I went back to Singapore and spent one year of online learning then, and now I'm back, and I, I know how it is. I can do that comparison of like what the online learning and the on-campus learning was like. Um, you know, it's an unprecedented situation. I uh, can't really blame anyone for how the online learning went about, but now that we know that it's, it's coming up, that more, not just international students, but um, through my interactions, like a lot of um, domestic students, especially mature age students who are working as well, want to do that online learning. I think the thing for me that I feel like we need to explore a bit more is how are we going to engage students, how are we going to give them that holistic experience that's just, not just your you know, degree, not just a piece of paper, but how are we going to teach them that soft skills that we keep talking about to get them ready for the future and that to like, to online learning. Um, for me, like last year, making friends, losing all my interactions, even though we're so connected via technology, um, it was very difficult. And I think um, it's not impossible to engage students, um, it's just about creating a collaboration between the university and students and figuring it out how we can make it more engaging, not just to our classes, not just to Microsoft Teams, but like events that can be held online, networking online, you know. Um, so yeah, that's where I stand on like um, what the future experience is gonna look like, so yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. great. We're gonna return to those themes in a, in a minute. And I'm going now to Georgie McDade on, online. Georgie, what's your reflections? Hello, Hello. Um, hopefully you can hear me well. <laughs> we can um, hear you so well, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, cool, so like when we talk about future fit, um, I think we really have to think about what that means. Um, future fit means no harm to people or the planet and being able to easily adapt to change with flexibility. In order to be future fit, universities must not shy away from the digital learning experience we got a taste for over the last few years. Um, this is not to say that campuses should never be open. <laughs> this just means that in order to be truly flexible and adaptable, um, 
we need to cause no harm to people and flexible learning must be an option available to all students across all campuses. And what would that look like? Um, you know, recorded lectures must be mandatory. No seminar loopholes, which don't have online options. All tutorials on campus should have an online counterpart so people at home can zoom in. Without an online tutorial option, you are locking out disabled students who are too unwell to travel to campus. Disability is not static, and one bad day does not mean we are not any less important to access education to our able-bodied counterparts. At the end of the day, we're paying the same hex. Online options don't just benefit us as disabled students, but students who have erratic work schedules. I know many in the room will say that uni comes before work, but when youth allowance is locking out students through the age of independence being at 22, work does come before uni because you can't learn properly if you haven't got food on the table. It also benefits people with caring arrangements who have sick family members at home. Their schedules cannot revolve around university either. In order to be future fit, you have to be flexible and students need to have their educational decisions placed back into their own hands. I found it interesting that in the quilt data, we apparently are a small group with differences not so large. All this shows to me is that no one is listening. We might be a small group at university, but we're not a small group in society. We make up 4 million people in Australia. So why aren't you engaging us? We are half as likely to have a degree. Why? Some universities' disability action plans haven't been updated in 16 years. None of this is a coincidence. Wow, I was gonna say, you go girl, online. Uh, and we've got another Georgie as well, so Georgie, thank you. Thank you, it's gonna be hard to follow Georgie on stage. She's <laughs> definitely the better Georgie, but yeah, here we are. Um, look, I think we're gonna follow on similar themes. Um, there are three massive things that I think need to change to for our university sector to properly be supporting our students as we go forward. Um, the big thing is what Georgie mentioned, looking at welfare. Real Hang on, Georgie, we'll just get your mic going. Oh. Well, do you want mine? All can good? You, can you say something wonderful. Oh. Okay, that, that was a <laughs> that was a main problem. <laughs> uh, right, let's go. Over yes, here. let's go. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so there's three big things that need to kind of change in order to actually be properly supporting students. The first thing is what Georgia McDay mentioned is around welfare. Realistically, that's the biggest barrier um, for students in you know completing their studies. At we have these massive hex, debt, hex debts. Um, they have doubled under job ready graduates for many students. It's ridiculous. Um, but for students, you know, being able to study full time is a luxury they can't afford. Um, you know, I know that's not directly a university problem, but realistically, we need the solidarity as students and we need the university sector supporting us when we say we need the age of independence lowered, we need increase to welfare support for all of the reasons we were talking about before. Um, I think the other thing we also want to talk about is um, students live, they live lives of insecurity, right? You're working low paid, casualised jobs, that you're constantly changing, you can't get rentals for more than a year, you, you know, you're changing jobs, you're changing friendship groups, your whole life is changing, right? Your one place of security is your education and it's your university. And so that means that universities need to really step up in providing that duty of care. Um, I think that we saw how desperately that needs to improve uh, when we saw the NSSS results come out at the start of the year. Um, the National Safety Survey was horrific and nothing had really changed since the 2017 change to the course. Um, when we look at this, when we look at the support that was provided to international students during the pandemic, when we look at the support given to disabled students, um, to the amount of students that are being dead named as they walk across the graduation, you know, these are things that students really need. They need the support of university and there's currently no mechanism that um, says 
There's no charter of rights or there's no, in New Zealand they have a pastoral code which says that universities need to do best by their students. And because there is no legislation around that, we need you to step up and provide that. And so when, and this will fall into my next point of we need to be talking to students and we need to be funding student organisations. Um, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think, um, and perhaps, you know, I am paid for by student money, so like slightly biased in this area, but I think <laughs> when we're talking about NSSS, when we're talking about how do we improve student lives, um, you should have democratically elected student unions or student organisations or associations on campus that you can talk to. Um, you have SAF money. That SAF money doesn't need, unless you're in WA, doesn't need to go to your student organisations and we have seen across the country, I could name and shame, but universities that aren't properly funding their students to be able to pull, do this advocacy work and um, it just creates ripple effects across the university and we see that student experience gets worse when you don't listen to students and when you don't fund them to do the crucial work. When NSSS happens, you know who has the answers of how we can improve those results? Students. You know who are the ones that are getting the disclosures? Students. We need to be funding them, making sure they're properly trained, making sure that they have the infrastructure and the qualified staff around them to be able to do something about it. Um, yeah, that's my... Thank you. Well said. Okay, I'm just going to put a, a question to the panel and then I'm going to go to the audience, both online audience and here in, in person. So get your questions ready for our students. And this is, anyone can jump in, I'm not going down the line, just jump in. But I'd like you to tell us what it's really like to be a student today. And I'll just tell you a perception that some people, no one in this room, definitely, but generally the idea is that students are there, they're waiting to come to the lecture theatre and when they get there, they're going to sit there and attentively listen to the lecture, in person of course, uh, for a good couple of hours. And then after that, sorry, they did all the pre-work as well um, before they came. And then once they're there, they've, they've got some amazing questions they're going to definitely question the, uh, the lecturer with. And then the, the rest of the day is, is just hanging around in a coffee shop and that's the end of the day. Now, no one, no one here would agree with that view, but I'd love you to give us some, what's it really like to be a student today? What's your life like? I'm gonna go to anyone. Come on, someone jump in. Lena just jumped in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, background, so I study um, the Bachelor of Film Production, which is of course a very on hands, practical um, career. Um, so, times right now there's definitely been an improvement compared to you know start of COVID times um, which is essentially when I when I started I started at the at, at the height of you know lockdown and um, everything was online so you can imagine how difficult it is trying to learn how to use a camera in our in our bedroom without actually touching it, <laughs> which has been very difficult. And then also, because um, the way my course is structured is very project-based. We're making you know, short films, short documentaries, um, you know, project work, um, which during COVID also you know, places a lot of limitations on us and we're trying to find out how to create projects that you know, we can do with limited gear, limited crew, um, COVID safety rules, etc. Um, and then now, sort of as I'm reaching the end of my degree and I'm seeing the um, students who have now started when we've come back onto campus, you know, the ideas that they come up with have been are so much more broader because they don't have as many of those limitations. I'm like, this is fantastic. It's great to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, sort of that progression through COVID up till now, it's, it's been a big change. Um, for, 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 my, for my course, and I assume other courses similar to mine. Um, so positive in that, in that regard, I think. Right. That's, that's Have you touched a camera now? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, it's good to know. Yes. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, yeah I'd like in. to jump in. Um, 
life for me as a student is um, probably very different to everyone else on the panel. So I'm a full-time academic at the University of Queensland. Um, I study full-time at the University of Melbourne. I'm doing a Master's in Employment Relations because that's what I teach at university. Um, but as a peak, peak um, student leader, my day is very different, so it would be very similar to Georgie. We're out there in the public advocating for the rights of students. So today, I'm sitting here in a, in a half an hour's time. I'm going to be online at a, a, a peak student kappa um, ACM. This afternoon, I've got a round table with the minister. So, you know, it's, it's very different. But in between all that, I fit in my family, my community, my teaching, everything else, and my studies. So um, life for us students um, that choose to be student leaders, to have that voice can be very different. And we need support. I'm gonna pick on what Georgie was saying. Like our peak student bodies are not funded by government and they should be. We beg for every single dollar we can get to actually do the advocacy work that we do. And it's really important that, one, universities recognise the work we do and give us time to do that within our workloads in our universities as students. Um, but it's also the government and universities needs to step up and say, yes, our voices are important and we're going to ensure that you have adequate support and funding to do the work you do. Mm, great. Anyone else want to jump in? What's it like for you? Um, I'm cruising. I'm doing three jobs, handing in all my assignments at 11.58 p.m. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm yeah. chilling. We know you, so. Um, no, um, <laughs> quite literally, it is quite like that. It's studying, working, and then um, sleeping if I'm lucky. Um, <laughs> but um, I'd like to touch upon like the student advocacy stuff as well. Um, you know, student collaboration with universities is so amazing. Um, I'm from UWA and like UW has got a great campus culture. Um, right in September actually we had, I think it was September, we had this like collegiate conversation about like climate change where it was like a room full of like staff, UWA staff, UWA students and we're talking about oh how can you know UWA you know divest from fossil fuels and stuff like that and it was just being part of that, being part of that conversation was so great and um, I think as uh, I think Dr. Lisa mentioned you know when students see universities engaging with students when they see that okay like they're listening to us they're they're having this conversation with us we feel better it's fine if the action's not there in that moment or we can understand that there's like long-term action needed but just being in a room with us listening to us oh it's amazing it's like wow like we actually have a say um we didn't have that last year when things went online and you know it was a lot of like trying to tell the university, listen, the online education is not up to the standard. We're paying all this money. You know, it, we want more than just um, an online class with just the professor speaking. You know, in in the video call, we want to be active. We want to have events. We want to talk to people. We want to communicate. As humans, we're just inherently looking for like connection. And I think university higher education, like that's such a crucial time for like us young adults and I think you know that's for me like student experience like my student experience right now is great I think there's always more connection that we can build upon and I think yeah thank you yeah. so much uh Georgie McDade I'm just going to go to you um because the online experience you, you know higher education's come through a period where it was all mainly forced online and now there's a lot of conversations about what the future should look like. And you talked a lot about flexibility. And I'd love you to talk about your experiences of, of being online. Hopefully it's working today for you and all of our online participants. <laughs> no, it's good that it's an option. Um, so for me, I guess, when you talk to students in general, I know that it might seem that um, this online learning thing was the worst thing that had ever happened um, and yes, that's true to some degree, but it's not because it was online. Um, the things people hated about remote learning was it was very disjointed, um, but we know how to do it now. Uh, and you'll find that a lot of students actually do prefer the flexibility, not just disabled students, not just people who are working. It's a common theme. You can Google it if you really like. There's plenty of surveys that show that about 70% of students do prefer some form of their course online. 
For me, I did really well in COVID because I am so unwell generally. And previous to COVID, if I was unwell and I missed a class, I missed a class. Um, I couldn't go to that shoot that week and the next week or the week after that. And I just had to cop it. There was nothing I could do about it. There was no way to supplement that learning experience that I was missing out on for no fault of my own. When we went into COVID, for me, it was great because I finally had the opportunity to learn from home. I'd never experienced online learning prior to COVID. Um, I study a science degree and don't get me wrong, I love my labs on campus. I'm not saying that those should be on, online at all. But I study sociology as well. And those tutorials worked really well online for me and for many other students too. And I just think that if we look forward into the future, that being the standard, as in, you know, we have the six tutorials on campus, sure, but we have one slot that's on Zoom, on Collaborate Ultra, whatever your uni uses, and people can just zoom in, no questions asked. I think that's a really important thing to take into consideration. You shouldn't have to get permission to use the online tutorial if it is there. Um, you should just be able to do it um, from bed, from work, recorded it, you know, just so you don't miss out on that education for reasons you can't control. Thank you so much. I might go to the audience now in the room while I jump up and grab the iPad for the online questions. Is there a question for the panel from the audience? Ah, already. No? Ah, good, at the front. Hello, um, I'm Alara Slattery from Bond University. I'm a student and president of the Student Association at Bond. Um, just a quick question to the room before I go to the panel. Everyone today who is a student, can you put your hand up? So there's a couple. A big problem that I think I saw when I'm at the conference um, today is it's all about getting the students involved. Let's listen to the students. Let's participate with the students. But every time I introduce myself as a student, someone's shocked that a student's here. And I think that universities and tertiary education, um, everyone should be bringing students along to stuff like this. You're having conversations about what students want without students. And I think having the panel has been awesome um, and you've all been incredible and I love everything that you're saying, but your listening to the students shouldn't be a couple of times a year at a conference. Um, that's one thing I can commend Bond on doing is they have students in every standing committee, academic senate, everything like that. There's at least one student representative and I think it's so important that everything a university does involves students. So getting them involved. So I guess my question to the panel is how can you employ, employ universities to get students involved more um, and what are your suggestions to tertiary education institutions on getting students involved? Thank you for the question. Did you oh. want to answer? I reckon, Georgie, you should go. Yeah, yeah, I can, go. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm ready. Um, okay, I think all of those things that you mentioned before, like going on all of the academic um, panels, going, making sure that they're represented on university council, that there's not one, that there's two, so that they're able to like actually collaborate. It's very daunting going in and being the only student. Um, you know, hats off. I have been in conferences where there has been like three students um, and like 20 million <coughs> professors and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> um, so, you know, hats off to Texa for actually, you know, and I know that there was an effort to do that. Um, but, you know, there was also a lot of universities that aren't, again, properly funding their student organisations um, that don't fund their students to be able to come to conferences like this. And these conferences are really important because you're able to, one, like it's upskilling, it's meeting other people in the sector, it's, you know, like we're still a crucial part of it. It shouldn't just be an and students. It's a, like, let's actually have a collaborative discussion. But yeah, I think it's making sure that they're involved in like every committee. They're involved, like they have something to say. So it's every committee um, and uh, it's just like talking to them. I, I don't know, that's a terrible response, but you get the gist. <laughs> I'm intimidated in a room of professors too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Tisha. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Actually, it's very important. Um, yes, uh, it's uh, like a student representation and student representatives union. They sh they, it is their responsibility for 
uh, to you know let the administration come down and you know sit with students. But I would like to uh, mention the University of Sydney's uh, University of Sydney um, uh, University of uh, uh, Sydney's uh, student union and student representation model. So at the top level there is uh, like Supra and um, uh, the university representation USU. Uh, and then uh, at the faculty level, there, there, there are uh, student representation at the faculty level as well. And then within disciplines, there is uh, a representative for each academic discipline as well. So I think these kind of uh, models would be great for universities to implement so that every, uh, like, you know, uh, voice of every student would be, uh, would be involved and would be taken into consideration. Thank you. There's uh, a couple of hands up over here. I might go to the middle of the room if we can. Thanks, Justine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Kath Ellis from the University of New South Wales. We heard from our minister this morning, and it's in the title of our conference today, is Integrity. We hear a lot about how students like you are being predated upon by these commercial contract cheating providers and other cheating providers who are constantly um, pushing students to engage with them to use their cheating services. I know there are a lot of people in the room who'd love to hear from you about what it feels like to have those companies um, approaching you all the time and perhaps to share your experiences of what you know it's like and, and what it feels like as a student to have these companies operating. Thanks Kate. One of the leading experts in academic integrity um, here asking the question, what's about academic integrity? Are the cheaters coming for you guys? I'll go quickly. Um, I think, yeah, I've like get ads for academic cheating websites all the time. I think it was a great initiative by Texa. Um, I think a lot of the problems when it comes to academic integrity, um, I don't like in terms of my focus on it, it comes down to the systemic issues of like why a student cheats. Um, and often it's because of welfare issues. It's because you've, you know, and I was having a conversation about this with my housemate and she like works at Macca's, gets below minimum wage, she's on youth wages. She's, you know, having a rough time of it, working multiple jobs, um, trying to finish her degree. Um, and, you know, when you have assignments due at 11.59 and you're really, you know, you've worked the whole day, you're exhausted and then you go and, you know, there's 20 million ads on Instagram from, like, I don't know if it really counts, but, like, Chegg and, like, well, like, that's all over my TikTok. And it's, like, the temptation is there. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of, you know, focus at, you know, getting rid of cheating and um, doing, you know, as the government did when they first come in, like, criminalising all of those websites because they just prey upon vulnerable students, but there's also needs to be a focus on what makes students vulnerable because they're, a lot of them are fixable problems. Yeah, um, Anushka? Yeah, I think you know, that's really well said. Um, completely agree with that. Um, from the international student perspective, I think the biggest problem we have is like information dissemination. Like how, like we don't know, like a lot of students come with language barriers. They don't understand the Australian regulations. They, they get these ads, they're like, it looks pretty legitimate maybe. And there's always that fear of failing for international students. You know, you're paying, you or your parents are paying like you know, 15 to 25K per semester and it's like, you can't fail. Um, and so then that's why they kind of get trapped in that, that oh, maybe I should try this. Maybe I should, you know, see if, I can, if, I'm, if I'm not doing well mentally. So I think one is that when international students come onto campus or, you know, start their degree with uh, the university, universities, I mean, I know we go through like a little module called academic misconduct and stuff like that, but I think it's more about having a conversation about, listen, like we understand things come along in life, you get stressed, it's okay if you're not doing well in the middle of the semester, reach out to us, let us give you the resources, let us give you the support to help you, rather than you know, a student feeling like, oh my god, I have no other choice. So resources, 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 that's like my you know, number one thing with um, what higher education universities can do to help us. Mm. Yeah, do you, th do you guys think cheating's a problem? Like, do you see it yourselves? Yeah. I think we do. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's in, in the word itself. It's, it's kind of got a negative connotation. But I also think, like, 
sometimes you're put into a spot where you feel helpless and you feel like this is the only option I have if I don't do this. If I fail, my parents' hard-earned money is like gone in the drain and like it, that feeling you can't really, so I mean, hard to <laughs> put yourself in that position, but yeah. Mm. I'm uh, just going to ask a question from online, which is around the online hybrid option for classes. And, and Georgie's spoken about it a lot today, but I think everyone can pitch in. I reckon you guys should give us some advice in terms of higher education, because I've also been in classes online where I'm trying my best to get everyone online engaged and there's nothing coming back. <laughs> you know, there's no blank screens, everyone's camera's off and I'm really putting my whole soul into it. Uh, I think finally some poor guy turns in and says, yes, Claire, I'm here. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's true, it's really true. And this question is actually the opposite. It's people are online, but people are coming into class. We're hybrid today. I hope I'm acknowledging our online guests just as much as you guys here in the room. But what's some really practical advice from you in hybrid environments? How do we do a good job as academics teaching you? What's some really, give us some hints and tips. I think one really important thing is to have, you know, if you've got a, a lecturer that's actually doing the work, having somebody there that can monitor what's happening online as well, because it's very hard for that one person to do everything. I know sitting sitting in both chairs, um, I find that, you know, if you're doing a hybrid, you're giving a lecture, you've got students asking questions in the audience and online, you don't want to actually, you know, kind of preference one or the other. So I think having the resources to ensure that both cohorts are taken care of really well is really important. Any other hints and tips for us? Call them out. Sorry. Call yeah, them go them for it. <laughs> yeah. I, like I think that's like on point. Like I think realistically, it's like the same as any normal classroom and. Um, it's like setting expectations. You can set like, it's saying, okay, so I need everyone to have their readings and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not a perfect student. I'm, you know, sometimes I'll just be lazy and have my camera off the whole time. But it like, then if a teacher is like, Georgie, can you turn your camera on? I'll feel guilty and I'll turn my camera <laughs> on and I'll be engaged in class. So I think it's like, it's also just making, it's like stuff around cameras. I know that there is stuff, Recording. some people are really uncomfortable with that within their home. So it's like, You've kind of got to be okay with that, but um, as much as you can try and create an interesting lesson and you can try and, you know, really invest in the students and allow time for students to mingle with each other um, and for there not just to be that academic side, that there is also like a social discussion within the classroom can help in just creating a community and if there's a community, students are going to be more engaged. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to actually wrap up the panel now. I want everyone to thank our student panel.